Um, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Christian Cruz, soon to be Dr. Christian Cruz. Okay. I'm looking forward to calling him that, by the way. Um, you can never have this, you can never have too many doctors that you know, by the way. Uh, he will be speaking about typewriter fonts are long dead, are dead, long live typewriter fonts. I'm really looking forward to hearing you talk and take it away, Christian. Right, right, Let's see, I hear echo in here. Maybe I have a so, no, that's right. So, yeah, hi everyone. I just uh, so you got uh, detecting, can you please uh, upload and no, I'll just open the PDF for me, please. Yeah, Yves, yeah, it's said uh, midnight. Yeah, oh man, so uh, thank you for staying awake at night. So, no, yeah, different time zones. So, it's always an effort to, to be there. So, yeah, Yves, thanks, and Hiki as well you know, on the chat. So, uh, yes, uh, as Karima said, I'll be talking about typewriter fonts. I'll just pull it off. I think I can do it as well. Here we go. So, the talk uh, that, that I'll be delivering today is uh, it's kind of something that I have to go through over the last few years, like maybe five or six years, uh, researching typewriter fonts. We should know why in a second. Let me just go through the slides. So yeah, exactly why this topic? I started in 2017 a PhD in design at the University of Newcastle, Australia. So for those who know me, I am Brazilian, uh, organized a type in, in, in Sao Paulo in 2015. And then in 2017, I moved to Australia to do a PhD. Uh, I studied in Reading as well in 2009 in typeface design. And uh, I wanted to do this exploration uh, like about uh, how we can promote censorship or the awareness of censorship through visual storytelling. So I was trying to use my skills as a graphic designer, as a practitioner, and also as a type designer in trying to see if I could do something socially, like uh, bring it back to the community. So that's uh, the project that I felt there would be a good opportunity for that. And I push a hashtag in there with the date that is starting 2017 and I should, 2021 as, as a finish, the end date. But actually, because I submitted two two months ago, and in Australia you submit your thesis and you don't have the chance to present at the end, and then the examiners they have up to three months to 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 review your your thesis. In my case, I I did like two months ago, so I'm still waiting for them, uh, like the agony of just sitting it down and waiting for 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 an answer. But yeah, so kind of soon to be a doctor, as Karima said, hopefully. So the whole thing uh, about it is that I, I decided to use, uh, I was, since I was talking about censorship, and as a Brazilian, we did have a massive dictatorship from the 60s to the 80s. And I wanted to use this as a case study uh, for, for my project. So basically what I did, I have to look at the archives. It was uh, hands-on uh, research. I was looking at the sensorial files that we still have at the Brazilian National Archives. So essentially for being a military dictatorship, they love to produce documents. So they, and they still have it, they still store it in, the, in that building. And if you go there, essentially what you find is like heaps of boxes. And uh, this is for movies. And then there are reviews about uh, movies, movie trailers and so on. But you have for the whole thing, for songs, uh, soap operas, uh, magazines, newspapers, everything that you can imagine was censored back then. And I was looking at those reports. So here an example of a book. So these are the sort of files that you might find. And then as you can see, uh, like the connection with this topic is that in that time during the 60s to the 80s, everything was produced, all the documents were produced via typewriters. So that's, that's how I got into this topic. And here, just a sample, like a close up with or some of those reviews. So the same thing, they, they just uh, file a report and then they give a review if that, uh, in that case was a soap opera, if it was uh, approved or not, they put the comments on and that's how the whole process uh, happened. And what I did with this process was to identify 
which kind of sensor words will come along with that. So I created a database of sensor keywords. So here you can see some samples of uh, some, some, some materials that used to be sensored back then. And I created a, a database that has more now, uh, more than 1500 uh, sensor words, either in Portuguese or English, because I, I, of course the, the content is in Portuguese, but I also did a database in English as well. And at the end, I created this typeface, which is part of my PhD. That is a typeface of sensor itself. And based on that database of sensor words, and the idea is to provoke creative responses by making people use the font and get the experience of being censored by themselves. So I'm not going to dive into too much in this project because then, of course, this is not the topic of this presentation. Uh, but just to have an idea, then by looking at this uh, uh, this process, of course, when I wanted to, cho uh, to choose which letter forms I would be using for this project, uh, since the beginning, I knew there would have to be uh, uh, typewriter fonts because that was like the aesthetic uh, of that, uh, that period of time. So the first thing that I had to do was to look at the type typewriters. So these are sensorial documents I could find for, uh, I took pictures of more than 1500 uh, uh, documents in that archive over a, a couple of months. And these are the four different fonts that I could find within the reports. As you can see, they change a lot from one to another. And because uh, I wanted to get inspiration about my font, how I would look, how I wanted to look like at the end. And then also what I did, I bought some uh, typewriters uh, on in markets, like say uh, online markets that people sell secondhand stuff. And I bought a few of those, apart from the top one on the right, which is mine. So I have I had this one since I was a kid. And uh, but I was I was buying those typewriters to check it out the fonts that came along with that, because I had this idea of maybe finding an iconic one and then just re make a revival of that uh, letter form to make it work as a, uh, as a typeface. But then what happened is within this process that was, as any PhD is not like straightforward, uh, it took me like a, a year or two to figure out what to do. Uh, I wanted, uh, at the end of what I decided to do is actually to look at the document that enacted censorship in Brazil, which was this one, the AI5, which was a, a decree that actually enacted censorship, made, made it official. So, it is like a nine page document. And what I did, I, I had access to make a really high scan uh, resolution uh, resolution scan uh, within that archive. So I was more than 1000 DPIs. And then I had the chance to zoom in and then make a really close to the original uh, to vectorize really, really close to the originals. And I decided to use this font because I said, this is one that enacted the censorship. It makes more sense to use this uh, all along. So well, this is just, I have an idea how it works. This is in the typeface. And uh, in, this is like a, a Wikipedia page from Augusto Pinochet from, from Chile, the dictator from Chile. So just how you can see how these different instances from the typeface. But as I said, I'm not gonna dive into that. So I just invite you, if you wanna know more about this project, you can just, uh, you can actually have, a, you can test it out. I created a, a browser plugin for, for Google Chrome so if you go to Chrome Store and just type it out, Sensurativa, which is the name of the project, you will find this plugin that well, essentially does what happened in the previous screen. You just replace the font with mine, and then you show up all the sensor keywords. They will show up, and there are some really nice effects, which I don't want to spoil, so I'm not going to talk about them. I prefer you to find them by, by yourself. So yeah, that's it for, for, for the introduction why the project, why... why why it has to be uh, this topic for research. So I'll just talk a little bit about then typewriter fonts itself. Uh, by the way, I'm not gonna dive into what is uh, in details, like a, uh, what it constitutes a typewriter font or, or not. Uh, in order to, for that, actually, I would refer to the talk of Maria Ramos in 2018 in ATIPI. She did a really nice talk and in Solign in YouTube, you can check it out later on. And uh, she did this as a, the MATD research in writing as well. And later on became a book. I think she just released it last, last year. So I really recommend that. She, of course, she's focusing more in Olivetti fonts, but also she goes for, for others. She, she does a really good overview of typewriter fonts as well. 
And uh, so, as I said, I did. Uh, I've been doing that for seven, eight years, just looking at typewriter fonts and collecting them. And uh, I, at the end, I'll show you a, a kind of the way I catalog all of them. I'm not trying to create a, a system or anything like that. So, especially now that we we de <laughs> we're not going to Vox anymore. So, I'm not going to there. It's just a way to understand uh, different uh, aspects of typewriter fonts. But that said, uh, some of those that I, that I seen at the beginning, especially the very, very beginning. Yeah, so I've been collect, uh, collecting fonts from typewriter fonts for the last seven, eight years. And also, I would like to refer to this website, the typewriterdatabase.com, which is really good if you want to have a look at typewriter fonts. Uh, and just because they have as more than or nearly 9,000 uh, typewriter typefaces on their system, and they're referring to which machine it came from. So then, yeah, just like a quick overview, what is a typewriter typeface? Because that's something that's, it's been a, we don't have consensus in this, because first of all, people think, okay, monospace it. So that's what it makes a typewriter font. But as you can see, uh, as you can see in some examples uh, that are gonna show that not necessarily it needs to be monospaced, almost fix its size. Because then you think, okay, typewriter fonts, they are not scalable. We have to fix, uh, if you have like 10 point size, that's what you got which is not necessarily true as well. And also the aesthetics that we're looking at. Of course, we are looking at, at a period of, of time uh, that maybe like 50 years or a little bit more than that, that of course there is the aesthetic of that, uh, that period. So that's why uh, typewriter phones they have a similar look, but I'll show as well there's some different cases. So let's dive into those. Just first, uh, first of all, for instance, uh, when I was looking at the, uh, the, the lovely book from Bruce, uh, Bruce Kennett about uh, Dwiggins, that he brings it up that Dwiggins did an experiment with, uh, with variable widths uh, for typewriters, uh, fonts, when he was doing one that probably was for Underwood. That was never published this font, but here you can see the sketches. And that was, because uh, that's something that I was thinking about mine. I was saying, yeah, I'll do something that is proportional widths. And then when I saw this, oh, okay, here we go, Dwiggins again. He, he thought about that way before me. And yeah, it's, he's a legend. So yeah, he, he did think about this in the past. So that brings it down the concept that it has to be only monospace. So it doesn't necessarily mean, especially when you go to the, the other parts, when it came to the electrical typewriters, then we did have a few of those that have proportional widths. As you can see here on the right, uh, this is uh, a, a few fonts for Olivetti. So the same thing, you can have a different different widths for, for some characters. But of course, in general, it is like the one on the left that is a uh, courier that it has the same width for all characters. But then it comes up when I say again, the fixed size, the uh, IBM Selectric uh, golf ball, which is something that came in the 60, late 60s that also had you the chance to replace the font. So I think that's something that I only discovered when I was doing the research. And the same thing, it is a Courier uh, 10 point size, but it could also have uh, 12 or other different point sizes. So also uh, kind of brings it down the concept that typewriter fonts have to be one fixed uh, size. It doesn't mean that they have to be. And about the, the, uh, the aesthetic of the letter forms, mostly there is a division of, between uh, Pika and Kubik uh, and Techno. This is mostly for Maria Ramos. She made this distinction about, uh, so if you want to go through these the categories, go to her. She, 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 she did a really good job on that. But one thing that I, when I was doing the research that it struck me out, as you can see on the left, there are even some kind of fracture fonts or even script fonts that I never thought of having those interpreters, but they have, there is a lot of cases of typewriter fonts uh, from the 60s and the 70s that actually had this particular uh, style. And then also one of the main characteristics is the brokenness of the ink when it, when he it strikes on the paper. So that's something that's really uh, picky for, for typewriter fonts. Some of them, as you show, I'll show up later, some digital fonts they try to emulate that. And, uh, but then also, uh, I'd like to bring it down, since you talk about aesthetic, 
is that it doesn't necessarily have to be like a really sturdy letter forms, which was one of the requirements to actually hit properly on the paper. But at Oliveri, they do, uh, Adriano Oliveri, he, he was pushing forward to have really fashionable designs. So that's why he established an in-house type design department back in the 50s. And here you can see one uh, from Wing Crow that was originally made for, 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 for the Oliveri. And as you can see in, in early mid 70s, the, this, this is style that became more popular later on in the digital era, era, but still you can see in the back in the 70s. So it was more about uh, the technical improvements as well, but also the aesthetics of uh, each, uh, each period of time. And here, just like make a, I mean, I made a really interesting selection, I guess, that we have fonts like this one, Lateral's Wash, which I think is not even in the market anymore. That's what I collected that from 10 years ago, I guess. And you see some swashes on, on, on the font. So uh, even kind of a ligature between the R and the A as well. So you see that you can do that with typewriter fonts with that particular style as well. Of course, some of them, they might work better than others. Uh, in that case, I don't know necessarily if it works because some, uh, some of the letters, they don't fit properly. But anyway, I think it's worth giving a try. And instead of just doing the basics, trying to do something else, like the one on the bottom left with, uh, with a dotted uh, serif uh, typewriter typeface. And then on the other end, we have our, our, our recent release from Toshi Omagari that he's also presenting here at ATIPI. And uh, he's, he established a foundry that has a lot of typewriter fonts. So if you want to go for contemporary typewriter fonts, you start with Toshi. Definitely go to his type foundry. And uh, you see a few different ones that, uh, like this one, that's pushing forward the idea of having a humanist sen sense to be used for coding. So uh, instead of just have those kind of boring, like qu uh, with quickness on, on, on the letter forms, you can have actually some fun and have something really interesting going on. And then let's move into contemporary approaches. Uh, so this is what I did when I was trying to analyze the fonts for my research. I got, uh, I think 120 uh, different fonts that I look at uh, closely during that period. And I tried roughly to put them in these five different categories. But yeah, I have to be careful of saying categories because it's just like, it's just a division of, uh, of them is not, it, I don't pretend them to be categories actually. So it's just like this, how, how many fonts I looked at and how, how I organized them. So the first thing was the contemporary monospace, which I, I mean, there's fonts that are inspired by, like, by being monospace, but not necessarily inspired by typewriters. So the IBM Plex, I think is one of the best examples of that category. And that's half of, of the fonts that I look at, actually they fit within this category. They sometimes they just, uh, they just play around with the concept of having fixed width, and have to work with that, but not necessarily are referring to the aesthetic of typewriter fonts. The second category, it would be like emulating typewriters. So like the FF Trixie, which is probably the best example of that, that has even so many different glyphs that are trying to emulate the brokenness of the ink. And I have 34 of those in, within that category. Uh, I found seven fonts for coding that are kind of, that actually said uh, they are, like they stated they were designed to be used for coding. So I put Cordelia from Fantoshi again here as an example, 22 typewriter inspired. So the same thing, they're inspired by typewriters, but they are further than the first category. And especially if, if you see the American typewriter is not even a uh, fixed width. So you can see it's like a proportional style. And uh, so many people use that, uh, that font trying to emulate the use of a typewriter. Uh, but they, they're aiming to have the traditional one. So if you use American typewriter, you're not going to get it because it has like proportional widths. Unless you're looking for the uh, electric typewriters from late 70s and mid 80s. And then the last one is for screenplay. So I put here like the Courier Prime, which is the only one in the category that was specifically designed for that. But I'll show that in a minute. So the, uh, the thing about the emulating the brokenness of the ink, of, as I mentioned, Trixie, uh, there's a really nice one that, especially for being designed so, such a long time ago, that emulates in different instances uh, the, 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 the brokenness of the ink. 
So that's one of the one of the contemporary approaches is to find ways of getting a clean uh, design and actually just add with technology and adds the uh, the emulation of the brokenness. So here's a different one that does have a uh, Python script to emulate the brokenness. And as you can see, like 10 years ago, so it's not that, even that new. So people are trying it out, different ways of approaching to this. Uh, the experience I have myself with this by doing my phone is that we, by having so many the, the anchor points, the, the uh, like, the, the software crashes a lot, or even the font sometimes doesn't export uh, properly, and so I have to clean it up. So there's some technical difficulty in there still, but anyway, I think it's still valid to, to try it out. And then also there is this website to, that emulates the brokenness of, uh, of the ink, so it's called Overtype. So there's a link as well. I, I'll, I'll recommend you to try it out later on. And then you can just uh, grab some fonts and then you can expand or reduce the brokenness. Uh, and then also I like the concept that it was done here to do have two axes. One is the brokenness of the ink and the, also, the other is the ribbon ink, if it's fading or not, if it's getting old or not. So which gets two completely different results. So it's a, a really one that uh, I recommend to try it out. And the last, uh, the, the last part is then, uh, as I call it, like shifting uh, the, the meaning, well, which is, of course, most people just trying just to emulate typewriters. That's, that's the basic stuff when they want to have the aesthetic. And so they, they want just to go along with that. But that's the point. So now, nowadays, with some of the cases, you're shifting the meaning of the use of that. So we have to be careful with that. First of all, just stating that the very first typewriter font in 1874 didn't even have lowercase. So that's all only all caps. And uh, so, yeah, that's made for Remington. But more like, let's say, uh, more than 100 years later, then we did have, let's say, the second gap was when it shifted to, to the digital era, the mid-80s. And then we, of course, that's when we, we pretty much stopped using typewriter fonts for at least for, for a while, which now they're coming back again. And then here it brings actually the context of the user uh, of using typewriter fonts. So uh, here I even got a quote from Jeremiah Shoff. He, he, he had like this, uh, this type wolf, uh, it's like a consulting for, 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 for typefaces. And he, he provides like some, some feedback on different styles. And he made this quote about like monospace typewriters usually bring to mind typewriters in computer. However, they can be perfect choice for designers looking for a sparse, minimal, and undesigned feel. I really like uh, uh, to underline this part of undesigned, which is like, let's say when, when you're using a typewriter, you didn't have the chance to, to you didn't have much control of the changing, you don't have to change this type size unless you're using a goofball then you have the chance to, to do it. If you have different ribbon inks, let's say sometimes it will be between black and red, you hardly go over that. But besides that, you don't have much control. So that's why I think when he says under the uh, undesigned feel, which is really a valid point as well, but I would say. But then you see nowadays people using in so many different ways, which I actually encourage using. Just the only thing you need to think, out, uh, think about is the context, if it does make sense or not. So the first one on the left, the different sizes, if you mix it up and, it, and you can see that it's not that much different. So that's the only thing myself, I would avoid that because you don't have that with typewriter. So maybe if you if you do it, maybe you're like the difference or, or if you just be aware that you're not actually emulating a typewriter at all, it's like it's going to have just half a, halfway through the, the, the reference. But anyway, sometimes you don't want to have the reference. You just find it cool to have those letter forms. So here we go, do, go ahead. Uh, here though, on the center as well, they have mixing uh, four typewriter fonts in the Alanis Morissette uh, album. So that's something, the only thing that would avoid that because unless you want to get the look and feel that we have four different people putting hands on to produce that material. But if, you go, if that's the context, go for it. And recently, also we have the Instagram stories uh, that you can use uh, some uh, something like looks like courier as well. Go ahead, you can use that and bring it up this aesthetic to your project. 
And then if the whole thing, that's the question that was in my mind for years, even before starting this project, I had this uh, crazy idea of imagining if typewriters are still being produced nowadays, how they would look like. Because uh, uh, that was the first idea for, for the project. I wanted to have just a font that uh, instead of being a revival, as I did at the end, because I felt it was more interesting or, or more relevant, but the uh, the original idea was to think about if typewriters still being produced, how the, the letter forms would look like. And then I started asking even some people to about it. And in 2018, I made that question to Matthew Carter during the ITPI in Antwerp, and then he said that they would look they would look the same because they look official. So that's how Matthew Carter uh, his his approach uh, approach to typewriter fonts. Which indeed is a really, really valid point that uh, the, the usually typewriter fonts, they look official. And the only thing that it may be look official if you look back for a f maybe a decade or two decades or three decades ago, because it will start to fade away, I guess, this uh, this perception over the years, because we, we are not looking at uh, producing documents anymore that use typewriter fonts. But it's still, we have this, we still have, it, it brings this kind of official look I think especially how the imposing look when you want to be oppressive in a sense as well, then you go to typewriter fonts and especially in authoritarian regimes, that's that's how you, how they go for it. So uh, so maybe, yeah, maybe democracies, I, I wouldn't go that much nowadays, but it's still a valid point. And then of course that it brings nostalgia. That's also another aspect of it. But uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, Matthew, Matthew Carter for his feedback. And then actually, I want your feedback as well. So please leave in the chat or approach me later if you have, uh, or what do you think about it? And then just like a, overthinking about this a little bit is that we do, we did have typewriter fonts like Courier that used to be this, the default for, for some even official documents a long time ago. There's some uh, United States uh, departments, I think it was Department of Defense or something that up to 2004, they used to have Courier as the official font, but now they shifted to Times New Roman. And also Calibri, that's in Brazil, all the official documents nowadays, they are designed in Calibri. So then I think that, that's how I said the perception might change over the years. So in a few years time, when people think about official in Brazil, they will think about Calibri rather than thinking about typewriter fonts. And then as, uh, there's a feature mono uh, 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 by Clean uh, Type Foundry as well. That's, uh, yeah, Chris, he always like have some really nice concepts for, for his fonts. And I think that's probably the closest that I got from the my original idea. That would be like foreshadowing how typefaces from typewriters will look like at present. He, he, but he, of course, his approach was different. He was looking backwards. He was looking at how Paul Rainer would uh, would do a, a feature for a typewriter, how he would uh, adapt that to, to a typewriter, which I think is a really lovely uh, project as well. So that proves the point there is room for improvement or room to do different stuff with uh, typewriter fonts, thinking about the aesthetic and thinking about the style as well. And there is one, that's actually one uh, uh, category that actually specifically uses uh, monospaced fonts. And in that case, Courier as well, specifically, that is for screenplay writing. There's something that's still uh, nowadays in Hollywood, people still use Courier 10 point size as a default for screenplay. And essentially because one page of that means one, play, one minute of screenplay. So that's uh, like the, the, the basic for, for the industry. And especially if you look at old uh, scripts, uh, so here like Stanley Kubrick writing the uh, uh, the Shining, it, the same thing he was writing with the typewriter. I, I had the chance to see one, one of the original scripts once, and uh, and yeah, that's people still using that. But the problem was that Courier, well, the, the the digital font of that, the original one, was designed actually directly from the metal part of the, uh, of the font of the original one and not uh, considering the, uh, the effect on paper, because the, the, the original one was, was designed in a way, as soon as it strikes the paper, it gets thicker. And so that's a font, uh, uh, that, uh, that's why this font that was designed in Career Prime was designed actually to make it slightly darker to adjust and compensate 
for, for that to give it back to Korea, the original look, how it was supposed to look like or on, on the screen. And they did it specifically for screenplay writing. So as you can see, there is room for, for, doing, uh, for doing different stuff. And the last one, of course, is coding, that people, they, they use monospaced fonts uh, for coding. And I think that's when uh, I made this long connection to bring it back to this, to say that, of course, here's monospaced fonts mostly. doesn't necessarily have to be typewriter fonts at all. So sometimes is uh, the the terms are, are interchangeable, but in most cases they are not. So you have to be really careful about the context and what you are aiming with that. But I really like to see now that people, especially for coding, at the very beginning they wanted to have this really mechanic look, but now more and more often we see different ones. Like input was a few years ago, and it was a really nice font as well. And now Cordelia, the same thing that brings a humanist look. To, to coding, so yeah, I, I'll, I hope to see more of that uh, in the future, people approaching different ways of you looking at coding and thinking about, uh, of course, functionality first, but also think about the aesthetic. And thinking of that, this uh, there's the same thing like for uh, the context, which I think that's yeah, the main part of my topic is like uh, think of putting things in perspective and putting in the right context that in coding, for instance, the function, and uh, we have also think about the function versus aesthetics. And in coding, that is that's interesting fact about input that is free to be used for coding, but if you want to do for publishing, then you have to pay for it. And uh, and I think that's something that DJR, he made a really nice concept that say, okay, yeah, it was made with uh, coding in mind. If you use for that, that's free. But if you want to do for publishing, then you have to pay as any other retail fonts. So, and then you can see some samples here on the right of people using uh, that font for, for publishing. So again, there's no boundaries, boundaries of how we can use uh, typewriter fonts. The only thing that I would say, be always careful about the context and what do you want to, what message you want to address. I think that's the most important thing at all. And that's it for me. So I would like now, it's not your turn actually. Uh, so I'll, I'll pose the question to you. If you think that we still need typewriter fonts and if so, which ones? So feel free to reach me out either here with questions or later on on Twitter, Instagram. So just reach, reach out so we can talk about it. And because uh, I think that's a topic that we definitely, we could have more discussion about it. Well, either like the boundaries of aesthetic but also how we can go through that if we should stick to, to the uh, nostalgia and be really faithful to, to the original state. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. So I think, yeah, Karima, she's trying to get back in. That, yeah, we had this problem in the very beginning for the, with, yeah, so I'll, I'll moderate myself, I guess, for a while, <laughs> if that's all right. So just looking back here in the chat. Yeah, thanks very much, everybody, for, for the comments here on the chat. Let me see if I have us, any questions at all. Yeah, still muted. Yeah, which is weird because it shows up as, as yeah. But that's all right. Uh, no worry, Karima. I'm just going through here with the chat to see if there's, um, there's more comments and. Uh, Yeah, we have a question here that, what well, like from from uh, rent, like what do you think uh, of what I call folk no spaced <laughs> folks no spaced fonts? They feel monospaced but not. Yeah, that's a really nice question actually, because 
I was doing a project, I think it was 2013, that the part of the brief said that I could only use monospaced fonts. And it was supposed to be, but it could be any monospaced fonts. And I had to produce, I think, 20 different pieces, different posters. And for each one, I would be using a different typewriter font or actually monospaced font to be more precise. What happened is when I started research, researching and looking for fonts, I realized that maybe one third of them, they were not even monospaced at all. Even they pretended to be monospaced, which I think it's kind of a, it was really intriguing that uh, people actually claim to be monospaced, but they are they're not. So yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really nice one that maybe it should fit if it is to create a, a category is to put them together that they they want to look like monospaced, but they're not. And also on the top of that, there is also the families nowadays that they have um, they have both actually. So I think IBM Plex is one example. They have the the monospaced ones, but I think as for the people that that design it at least once a monospaced forms, they know the trouble it is, especially with the spacing. For me, like is the one the part that gets me is the spacing, that uh, the or the space bar if you wish, that it gets too wide. So it, it gets annoying at some point, so that's why some people prefer to have an option. They have they have the original one, the monospaced, but they also have one that they tweak things, they bend the rules and do different things as well. But yeah, but that's a that's definitely a a, a good category. So let's see what else here. Oh yeah, Ana Sofia, yeah, she asked it for to so send the link for testing the typewriter font. Sure, I'll do. Just a second, let me put here in the chat. Just a second. If you can find it straight on from uh, from Chrome, you can reach out on social media as well. I have I created an account for we have like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter for for the project that's called Sensurativa. But here we go. I'll post here the link on the chat. So is it for 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 people that are familiar with uh, using uh, the the Chrome extensions, you just click on that and then you you can see on the spot. So yeah, please feel free and also give me any uh, feedbacks uh, on that later on. I'll, I'll love to hear some of those. So just going through the, the, the last questions. Yeah, Toshi said that Quentin Tarantino's screenplay is much denser than one minute per page. Yeah. And there's also the fact that uh, Tarantino, he would write most of the scripts on the spot. Like uh, he, he roughly had an idea, then he would like the previous day, he would write it down the, all the lines for the following day. So there's also this specific fact about him. Yeah, I think that's also John Barry said that if you don't need actually for the reason to be monospaced, there's no reason the aesthetic to, uh, uh, there's no reason other than that, the aesthetic to use a typewriter font, uh, which, yeah, I think in, in general, yeah. that's, a, that's the case. People use mostly for aesthetic purposes. Here we go, Karima. I hope, oh, okay. I, I apologize for the technical difficulties. <laughs> At one point, I couldn't see, you know, I couldn't talk, I couldn't see you. And then all of a sudden, you disappeared, you were talking, and then I couldn't hear anything. So I actually had to close out of the browser and come back. I apologize. I, right. missed, I missed got, all the questions. Yeah, that's all right. You got censored. <laughs> I did get censored. It must have been swearing, I would say. It must have been all the yeah. swearing. Yeah. <laughs> And there's also Anna Sophia. She made a, qu a question also about if there are any typewriter variables. Uh, to be honest, I haven't seen one yet, but I bet we might have one already. That's actually a good good thinking. I'll, I'll have a look at that, but not the one that I, I'm aware of.
-hmm. Is there any other questions in the side in the chat that have not been asked? Uh, courier menus. So Damon is mentioning not monospace and some, some kind of higher resolution courier in the menus and a blow up terminal. Uh, I'm th front from windows on top of that. <laughs> some movie, <laughs> some prop designer was drunk. Okay, we get that. <laughs> Yeah, because I think usually mostly people are using without further thinking about the the, um, the context or, or using typewriter fonts. Some of them, I, I guess, they just look at the menu, like just browsing for fonts and think, okay, this looks nice. And then, uh, and then of course, you're evoking so many different aspects when you're using those fonts. So yeah, I think people have to be careful when the, with the purpose of the message. Uh... Anyway, I think it's lovely to have typewriter fonts. Lawrence, is mentioned, Lawrence Penny is mentioning recursive has five axes, which is interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah, thanks for that, Lawrence. Yeah. And then uh, Anna, I imagine varying the roughness or the defects, as you as you said. I yes. think she's I would say mine, uh, mine is variable, but not in the strict sense of uh, or what you can let's say I don't have different nexus, but I have some concepts of variable that even play with the width of the column. So maybe, I don't know, maybe do you have a few minutes? Uh, I could try to we do that. have a few minutes. So I'll bring it on straight from the, from the browser. Perfect. Yes. And while you're doing that, Damon has a question. Did you encounter Dua space fonts? And then he leaves, uh, he gives an example in uh, Font Squirrel, a uh, reader, AI writer do a space. Whoa, <laughs> got the sample, yeah. Really tight. Let me just check. I think that it doesn't show up my, my window, right? In the, uh, the browser. No, it just says click to start to share your screen. Yeah, because let me see. Because uh, I had the same issue yesterday, so probably it's not going to work. Okay. We can. Yeah, that's, a, that's fine. Yeah. But because, uh, yeah, because what I did, like, there's some sample, there is some features that actually is more, along, I think I'd say, yeah, it's more than variable itself. It's because it doesn't play, if, it plays along sometimes with the, the, the width of the characters or even the length of the, the entire sentence. Because I, I replace it full sentences sometimes for one word. So I have some di di really different features that uh, you type one word and you get another one. But mm -hmm. this used to happen like sometimes you get censored, let's say for a song, and they pick it up two or three particular words, and they require the the songwriter to change it in order to get approval, and mm -hmm. then they have to do it. So I put all of those different variations within the font as well. So you type one thing and you get another one. So it replaces on the spot. So. Yeah, there are a few, but it's more, uh, yeah, I would say more not necessary, of course, like the variable fonts in that sense. I don't have different access for, for, for tweaking things. And I think at the end is more, again, that it brings it back if you if you look at the original state of typewriter fonts, you didn't have those options. You couldn't even change the type size barely unless you have a small typewriter. So people, when they think about that aesthetic in mind, they don't think about options. I think that's yep. almost like, is almost like the opposite uh, desire, desire. Let's say if you desire for one thing, then you don't want to have options. So that's why I usually go for 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 typewriter fonts in particular. Then I guess, of course, if you, then if it goes to monospace, it as a lot uh, Larson was saying about like a, uh, that uh, recursive that has like the different different axes, then it makes sense to to go for that. And I think that might be the next step. Now to think about having this variable font technology, how can you use that properly for, for typewriter fonts? So yeah, it's up to you guys. Interesting. There is one, um, we got a response back for sharing your screen. It had to be up in the files and because it was not uploaded, we could not share it. I apologize to the audience. Oh, okay, that's right. Okay, no worries. 
Yeah, we got a response. So um, it said moderator has to start the share screen, but that would have been my screen. <laughs> and you know what is my screen? Trust me. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. yeah, maybe what we can do later on in the hangout to a room. If people yes. are there, then maybe Derek can show. That would probably that would probably be a perfect solution. Um, do we have any other questions for Christian today, tonight? Otherwise, we can move right over to the to the hangouts room. And Christian, are you available to talk yes, to them yeah. in yes. the in the hangouts room? Because why don't we move over there and then Christian can show share his screen there if that's all right with everybody. And then we do have another talk that's starting in about 13 minutes uh, with Jesse Chahul Chen. And it is Why So Square? The Practical Issues of Transcultural Chinese Typography. I've heard it's very, it's very riveting. So um, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Kaima. I'm gonna call you. I'm gonna call you Dr. Cruz if that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the talk, and we'll see everyone in the hangout room. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.